somebody, make some noise for Jesus in this place. There were some moments this year you didn't think you were going to make it to New Year's Eve, but you made it. So I want to give you just about five seconds to give God all the praise, all the glory, all the honor that you know he deserves, that you know he's good for, that you know. Welcome to Rally. It's New Year's Eve. It's good to be in the building, isn't it? I said it's good to be in the building, isn't it? Oh, yeah. My name is Charlie Hughes. Someone over there likes me. I love you. Whoever that was that said my name was good. I'm so glad you guys are here. Tonight's a Tonight God's going to move. Tonight God is going to speak. So in this moment, I just want you to prepare your heart, open up your mind, open up your ears, because this message is not for the person sitting next to you. This message is for you. Somebody say, this message is for me. Open up your Bibles. Turn on your Bibles. We are going to be in the book of Isaiah, chapter 43. Verses 1 through 2 and verses 16 through 19 are going to be our primary text. And just coincidentally, I don't know, maybe it was coincidence, maybe it was the Holy Spirit. Lucas did his prayer moment on this text as well. Isaiah 43, verse 1, reads this. But now... This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. Verse 16, this is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. This is what the Lord says. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. See, I am doing a new thing. See, I am doing a new thing. See, I am doing a new thing. This is the word of the Lord tonight. See, I am doing a new thing, but the question is, do you have the faith to perceive it? Is there anyone in this place? Is there anyone in this room? Is there anyone in this building that is wanting, hoping, desiring, praising, praying, and expecting for God to do a new thing in their life this new year? That was kind of convincing. I don't know about you. But there are some new things that I want God to do in my life this new year. There are areas of my life that I want God to change. I've got prayers that need answering. I've got fears that need conquering. I've got dreams that need directing. I've got wounds that need healing. I've got hopes that need reviving. I've got insecurities that need refining. I've got weaknesses that need strengthening. So one last time before I really get into this sermon, I'm going to ask, is there anyone in this room, is there anyone in this place that is bold enough, brave enough, courageous enough to admit that they want God to do a new thing in their life this new year? I'm going to give you five seconds to praise God in advance for all that he's going to do this year. Five, four. Three, get louder. Two, go crazier. One, our new thing's coming. Let me know. God's going to do a new thing. You know what's interesting? This passage of scripture, Isaiah 43, is not the prophet Isaiah speaking on behalf of Israel, asking God to do a new thing. This passage of scripture, Isaiah 43, is the prophet Isaiah speaking on behalf of God, asking Israel if they have the faith to believe for a new thing. Oftentimes, the reason we are not experiencing or seeing the change or progress that we desire in our lives is not because God isn't able to provide a new thing, but because we are unable to 
perceive a new thing. We become so accustomed to living in the darkness that is the confusion, the lack of clarity, the lack of change, the lack of peace, the lack of purpose, and the lack of progress in our lives. So we begin to lose sight of and lose hope in the possibility of things ever changing. No one dwells in darkness by choice, but darkness can be so hard to escape because darkness can seem so engulfing and all-encompassing. Darkness can be so dominating that it can cause you to start drowning in doubt. Feel as if there's no way out. And cause you to buy into the false belief that the darkness you are in and walking through is all there is and all there ever will be. The darkness you've been experiencing has been so depressing, so deflating, and so discouraging. It has convinced you into believing that the start of a new year has more power to bring about change in your life than the power of God does. But I believe I'm here on assignment tonight. I believe I'm on a mission tonight to let somebody in this room know that the change you are yearning for, the change you are desiring, the change you are seeking is not going to come from a change in the calendar year. It is going to come from a change in your ability to perceive in the midst of darkness. The change you are desiring is not going to come from the clock striking 12 at midnight. It is going to come from a conviction within your heart that you refuse to let the darkness strike out of you. The change you are desiring in your life is not going to come from a New Year's resolution. It's going to come from a new realization that the God who is with me is greater, stronger, and more powerful than the darkness that's surrounding me. I refuse to let you leave this year and enter the next one without first shining light on some truth in your life that the darkness is distracted from grabbing a hold of. The title of this sermon is Shine a Light On It. Shine a light on it. Look to your neighbor and tell him, shine a light on it. Shine a light on it. Get your phone out if you have to. Shine your flashlight in their face. Tell them, it's time to shine a light on it. Verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 43. Let's read it once again. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. According to this scripture, you were created and formed by the almighty and unlimited God. He has summoned you by name. You are his. At the most foundational and basic level of who you are, first and foremost, above all else, you are God's possession. You are God's possession because he made you. You were intentionally made, specifically formed, and intricately fashioned for a specific and unique reason. Not only this, but God has placed giftings within you to assist you in accomplishing and achieving the purpose and plan that he has for you. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 reads, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Like some of you in this room, I'm sure, I am a college student and I graduate college this upcoming semester. I cannot wait. It's been a long time coming. I will take your applause. I feel like I deserve it. There have been times when I felt like quitting and really I would have, but my parents just wouldn't let me. And I graduate this upcoming semester, I can't wait. But in my college career, there have been some classes that I've taken that, for lack of better words, I'll just describe as pointless. These classes have been just totally pointless. Among these classes have been Dance History Online, Intro to Digital Media, and last but certainly not least, Art Appreciation. Anybody in the room ever take art appreciation in school? The most pointless class I've ever taken. I've, I did not learn one thing. Nothing. Not a single thing. Nada. It's also as much Spanish as I know too. But there was a trend 
that I picked up on as I took art appreciation. We studied and examined art all the way from the Renaissance to the modern era. And I noticed that not once after an artist created a masterpiece, a work of art, did they look to someone else and ask, what should I name it? Not once they asked for a name suggestion. Not once they asked for a name recommendation. Not once did they relinquish their naming rights of their work to someone else. Why? Because only the creator names the created. So what makes you think that God will go through all this trouble creating you, making you, fashioning you, forming you, and having a specific and unique plan for your life just to let someone else name you? Do not let the darkness distract you, deceive you, or discourage you into believing that you are anything less than what God has made you to be. You are no accident. You are no mistake. You are no mess up. You are no screw up. You are no mishap. You are the product of intentional thought. You are the result of divine design. You are the outcome of omnipotent composition. You were created to be the object of God's eternal affection. You were created to be the beautiful beneficiary of God's everlasting love. You were created to move in purpose, speak with power, and walk in peace. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's handiwork. You are God's peace de resistance. You will be given everything you need to be exactly who God has created you to be. You are more than equipped and fully prepared to live a life full of purpose and supernatural significance. A dark room is a dangerous place because if you spend too much time in the dark without a good look at yourself, you'll begin to forget who you are and how beautiful as God made you to be. You'll begin to believe that you're only as beautiful as what you can see. You'll begin to believe that you're only as loved as the attention people give you. You begin to believe that you're only as valuable as the last successful thing you did. But say I were to lose my driver's license, the, the proof of identification given to me by the state of Florida. Say I were to lose it. This does not mean I'm no longer Charlie Hughes. This does not mean I'm no longer the son of David and Lisa. This does not mean that I'm no longer the older brother to Victoria and Zane. I'm still Charlie Hughes. I'm still Charlie Hughes because my identity is not determined by what a little laminate piece of paper says. My identity is defined by who God has made me to be. Just because you've been in darkness does not mean you are any different. Just because things are confusing right now does not mean you have changed. Just because you feel like you've lost your identity does not mean you have. No degree of darkness, no amount of confusion, no number of lies told to you can change the fact that because God made you, he's the one who names you, your identity is found insecure in Christ. In addition to this, you are not only God's possession because God made you. You are also God's possession because he paid for you. Let's read verse 1 just one more time. Verse 1 says this. This is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, read in the Passion Translation. For you know that your lives were once ransomed once and for all from all the empty and futile way of life handed down to you from generation to generation. It was not a ransom payment of silver and gold which eventually perishes. But it was the precious blood of Christ who like a spotless, unblemished lamb was sacrificed for us. God sent Jesus, his one and only son, to die on the cross in our place to clean up the mess we made and pay the price of our salvation. If this extreme 
crazy acts of generous love does not speak to how God views and values your worth as his possession, then I don't know what does. I don't know what does. Before you were born, God knew you. He knew every mistake you would ever make. He knew every bad thing you would ever do. He knew every way you would ever betray his trust. And he still sent Jesus to die for you. This is radical love. This is love that we cannot comprehend. This is love that does not make sense to our small and limited human minds. This is love that by almost any standard will be deemed irrational and insane. Like if one of my boys came to me describing some girl they were dating and said, yeah, bro, I've been dating this girl. She does everything I ask her not to do. She totally disrespects the boundaries of our relationship. She treats me terribly, and she cheats on me daily. But you know what? I think I love her, bro. I think I want to marry her. You know what? I would die for her. I would say to my friend, run from her. Are you kidding me? Die for this girl? You need to forget all about this girl. Don't die for her. Dump her. That's what you need to do. Immediately. ASAP. Pronto. But that's the crazy beauty of it. In view of everything you would ever do to hurt him, God still looked at you and said, worth it. Worth it. Worth it. I've heard it said before that something is only worth what someone else is willing to pay for it. God looked at you and said, worth it. To redeem is to gain possession of something in exchange for payment. Christ paid with his life. So if you choose to enter into a relationship with him, you may receive his grace. Your soul might be saved and your life could be forever changed. And if you want a receipt for the price that Christ paid for you, there's an empty tomb to serve as your proof. But I'm sure there are those of you here that do not like the word I'm using to describe our relationship with Christ as his followers, the word possession. And I get that. Like you, except when it comes to our relationship with God, I am very much against anyone possessing anyone else. I do not believe human beings should have ownership over other human beings. Slavery is evil. The Bible backs that up. But the difference is, God does not possess people to keep people in bondage. God possesses people to set them free. And the only appropriate response to this upside-down concept of God's possession of you is your devotion to him. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, read this. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's great mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words... Without embracing your identity as God's possession by devoting yourself to him, it will be impossible for you to perceive the new thing that God's getting ready to do in your life. A renewing of your mind comes through a renewing of your patterns. You cannot tell me that God possesses your heart and sin still has a seat at your table. Your ability to perceive in the midst of darkness will come from your devotion to run from temptation and to run to Jesus with all your heart and all you have. That was all verse 1. You guys ready for verse 2? Verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 43. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. We serve a present God. 
He's not some God that is up in the clouds, uninvolved and unconcerned with what's going on in our lives. He's a God that who, from the very beginning, has made it evidently clear that he desires to dwell among us and engage in personal relationships with us. For crying out loud, just a few days ago on Christmas, we celebrated the drastic lengths that God went through to prove that he is the God who was with us 2,000 years ago. He put on skin. He was born of a virgin named Mary, and he took on the vulnerable form of a newborn baby to show you that he's Emmanuel, the God who will never leave you nor forsake you. When you dwell in darkness, it's hard to see around you. It's hard to see in front of you. It's hard to tell which way is which. And it's easy to feel hopeless, helpless, and alone. Darkness is scary. And it encourages you to stay still, stuck, and stagnant. So that way the illusion of, a life of isolation can infect your minds with thoughts and feelings of insecurity and inadequacy. But what if the reason you've been alone is actually not all that dark? What if the reason you've been alone is not because there's anything wrong with you, but because God has been wanting to get you alone with him? To remind you that true power and fulfillment can only be found in his presence. In his presence. When you walk through the fire, you will not be set ablaze, you will not be burned, because who? God will be with you. God made us for relationships. Relationships are a needed and necessary part of life. But how many know when we get around the wrong people, when we have harmful relationships and negative influences in our lives, these relationships can distract us from God's presence, lead us down dangerous paths, and hinder our ability to perceive the new thing that God is getting ready to do in our lives. When this is the case, it's better to be alone with God and aware of what he's getting ready to do in your life than it is to be surrounded by people, confused, and having no way of knowing who God wants you to be, where God wants you to be, or what God wants you to be doing. Perceiving is the prerequisite to receiving. You cannot receive what you cannot perceive. Trying to receive what you cannot perceive because you are surrounded by the wrong people who are, who are clouding your judgment is like being a wide receiver in the NFL attempting to catch a touchdown pass as you're being double teamed by a pair of Pro Bowl defensive backs. It's not going to happen. The wrong people in your life will block you from your blessing, keep you from your calling, and push you away from your purpose because God will not direct someone who is distracted. And he will not trust his treasure with someone who will not even give him their time. God desires and requires our full attention, our undivided attention. An accurate perception of what is possible with God comes from getting acquainted with God's power by spending time in God's presence. This is why it's so important that you spend your time in darkness well. Don't let darkness scare you. Let darkness school you. Don't let darkness terrify you. Let darkness teach you. Don't let darkness discourage you. Let darkness develop you. You can spend your time in darkness stuck, still, and stagnant, or you can spend your time in darkness searching. You can let darkness discourage you by pointing out your biggest insecurities, your greatest weaknesses, and embellishing and exaggerating your most embarrassing flaws, or you can spend your time in darkness searching for your Savior, getting an understanding of his power and coming to the personal realization that everywhere I am weak, God is present and he is powerful. What is darkness anyways? I mean, I know tonight we're broadly defining darkness as the different things in our life that keep us from believing that God doing a new thing is possible. But in a physical sense, darkness is merely the absence of light. Darkness in itself is not a thing. It's the absence of a thing. 
So this means that wherever light exists, darkness cannot. And I don't know about you, but as a Christian who reads his Bible, this fires me up. This excites me. This encourages me. This empowers me because I know that in Luke chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of light. And I know that in Psalm 143, it tells that the presence of God is inescapable. There is nowhere we can go where the light of Christ does not shine. It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. So this tells me that as a Christian, because Jesus is the light that shines in the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome. And because Jesus is the light that is with me, and because Jesus is the light that is living inside of me, this means that darkness can do its best to discourage me, darkness can do its best to distract me, darkness can do its best to deceive me, but in all actuality, darkness cannot touch me, it has no power to destroy me, and it eventually must flee from me. Not only this, but if darkness cannot exist where the light of my Savior is present, this means that when put in the proper light, all my insecurities become non-issues and all my flaws become mere formalities. Because although I may have weaknesses, God's power is made perfect in my weakness. Everywhere I'm weak, he is strong. Everywhere I lack, he is enough. Everywhere I fall short, he stands tall. My God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. And in light of this, I realize, I recognize, and I can admit boldly with confidence and with courage that no weapon formed against me can prosper. Because I know that greater is the light that is with me than the darkness that is against me. With God, things that are once impossible on my own become possible because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. This is no cliche. This is gospel truth. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me because if God is with me, who dare be against me? Anyone ever sleep with a nightlight as a kid? It's like a weird segue, huh? Am I the only one? Around the age of five, I slept with a nightlight. This nightlight was cool. It had this little blue shell on it with these star and moon-shaped holes. Is that when it would turn on? It would cast shadows of moons and stars on my walls and ceiling. I love my nightlight. But the coolest and most comforting part about my nightlight was not the light that it would emit that would pierce through the darkness in my room. The most comforting part about this nightlight was the reminder it served me as a child that the father who plugged the nightlight in the wall was present down the hall ready to comfort me if I really needed him. Bury these truths, these scriptures in your heart as your spiritual nightlight. So that when life gets dark and when life gets scary, you can remember that you have a heavenly father who is present and ready to comfort you whenever you need him. The light that you carry illuminates the darkness and makes perceiving possible. Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 19. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. The Lord says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness 
and streams in the wasteland. In this passage of scripture, God is speaking through his prophet Isaiah to the people of the nation of Israel, letting them know that he's getting ready to end their time of exile. They had been displaced from their land, from their homes, and they've been wandering in the wilderness. And God is telling them, that new thing you've been hoping for, that new thing you've been praying for, I'm getting ready to do it. But by telling them to forget the former things, God is also saying, yes, I'm getting ready to do a new thing. But don't expect me to deliver you out of exile like how I delivered your ancestors out of Egypt. I'm going to do a new thing, but it's going to come about in a new way. For some of you, this is the word you need to hear tonight. God is going to do a new thing in your life this new year, and it's going to come about in a new way. That prayer you've been praying, God's going to answer it. But don't expect God to answer that prayer the way you saw him answer your friend's prayer. God's going to do a new thing. God's going to provide for that lack in your life. But don't expect God to provide the way he did for your neighbor. He's going to do a new thing. God is going to present himself to you this year. But he's not going to do it like he did for your mama or your brother or your sister. He's going to make himself known in your life in a clear way. But he's going to do a new thing. So do not try to put God in a box by wanting God to work within the limitations of your expectations. God is too big, too powerful, and too creative for the confines of your limited human imagination. It does not matter how God chooses to do the new thing in your life. The only thing that matters is that he is the one who is going to do it. So forget the former things. Be full of faith and open for God to do a new thing this new year. In a new way. But for others of you, I want you to hear the word of the Lord tonight. When he says, I'm getting ready to do a new thing. Forget the former things. And I want you to understand that God does not expect your perfection. He expects your passionate pursuit. You do not have to meet some standard of perfection in order to receive salvation. If this was the case, everyone would fall short. I quote the scripture a lot, not because I want to scare you, but just because I want to make sure you know that for all have sinned and for all fall short of the glory of God. Consequently, no one is perfect. God will not and does not expect of us that which he knows is impossible for us to achieve or accomplish. Furthermore, if meeting some standard of perfection was necessary in order to be saved, this means the death of Christ would have been pointless. Since none of us are capable of being perfect, this means that no one would be eligible to receive God's grace. Which means that Christ would have lived, suffered, and died for no one to ever be saved. God would never do that to Jesus. For this reason, salvation is not earned by perfection. Grace is a gift of God that is received through passionately pursuing Him. Now, God's grace is not a get out of jail free card. God's grace does not nullify your personal responsibility to be obedient to God's word. God's grace is freedom from sin. It is not freedom to sin. Passionately pursuing God does not mean that you will never make a mistake ever again. 
But it does mean that you will do everything in your power to not continue making the same mistakes. Your salvation is not predicated on your perfection, but your passionate pursuit will point to the position of your heart. God's getting ready to do a new thing. He's going to do it in a new way. But in order to start perceiving it, you've got to leave your past in the past. And that includes your poor, sinful decision making. But maybe you've been listening to every word I've said tonight. You're just having a hard time buying it. You're having a hard time believing it. You're thinking to yourself, how am I supposed to leave my past in the past? How am I supposed to forget the former things? How am I supposed to perceive a new thing? How am I supposed to believe that God wants to do a new thing, a blessed thing, a promised thing in my life? How am I supposed to passionately pursue God in the future that he has for me when there are so many terrible things that I've done in the past? I never said it was easy. But I want you to hear this. Your sin put God's son on a cross. If God can still find it in his heart to forgive you and forget all the terrible things you've done, then you can't see. Isaiah chapter 43 verses 25 say this, God speaking, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. Hebrews 8.12, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Hebrews 10.17, still God speaking, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Jeremiah 31.34, God speaking, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. In Acts 3.19, repent therefore, and turn again, that your sins be blotted out forgiven, forgotten. Turn again, I love this visual. It is hard to move forward in faith. It is hard to perceive a new thing. It is hard to passionately pursue all that God has for you when you are constantly looking back over your shoulder at all the former things that remind you of all the sins you've committed, all the things you've done wrong, and all the things in your past that you're ashamed of. This is why passionately pursuing God is the result of turning from your past and taking God at his word. Passionately pursuing God requires forgetting former things and fixing your eyes on things unseen. It means that you walk by faith, not by sight. To dwell in darkness is to dwell on the past. But it's hard for former things to keep you trapped in the past behind you when you're preoccupied, passionately pursuing all that God has for you. If you've ever had to navigate your way out of a dark room, you know that moving in the dark is difficult. It's worrisome. It's scary because you don't want to get hurt. You don't want to stub your toe. You don't want to trip. You don't want to fall. If you ever want to escape the darkness you've been living in, if you ever want to get out of the darkness that you've been walking in, if you ever want a light to turn on in this dark room, you have no choice. You have no other option. You must be obedient to the directions that God is giving you in darkness. The directions may seem confusing. They may seem uncertain, but God will not cause you to stumble or fall. God will not mislead you, but he will make your path straight. Like a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. If you would just trust God's word, if you would just get God's word on the inside of you, if you would just make God's word at home within your heart, God would be able to liberate you from the prison of your past and lead you out of the dungeon of your darkness. The darkness will do its best to deceive you, to distract you, 
and to discourage you into believing that you are what you have done and that you are defined by your greatest mistake. But can I just shine some light on the truth of the matter? God's grace is greater than your greatest mistake. God's love is more committed to rescuing you than your biggest L is to ruining you. You are not defined by the worst thing you are ever done. You are defined by the good work that Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. Don't be deceived by the darkness. You don't have to settle for former things. Because you're here, there is still hope. So move in the midst of darkness with unwavering convictions. Speak with undeniable confidence and step forward passionately pursuing with a passion that is unrelenting. If God says you're forgiven, then you're forgiven. If God says you're loved, then you're loved. If God says you're blessed, then you're blessed. If God says you're set free, then you've been set free. The shame of your past cannot stop you, and God's grace is your green light to start passionately pursuing all the things that He has for you. God is the wholeness of truth. It's impossible for God to lie. So when you trust His word, when you follow His directions, when you do what He's told you to do, it's impossible for you to fail. Don't be deceived by darkness. The darkness cannot destroy those who God has delivered. There is peace for you to rest in. There is purpose for you to live in. There is power for you to find strength in. So here's the truth of the matter. Former things cannot compare to what you have the power to receive. Because you know you are God's possession. Because you know that you live in the presence of the Almighty. And because you have a pursuit that is too passionate to be stopped, you carry a light that is too bright to put out. I think the devil's afraid of who you'd become if you took God at his word. I think the devil knows it would cause you to start living differently. I think the devil knows it would cause you to start walking differently. I think the devil knows it would cause you to start talking differently, speaking differently dreaming differently, hoping differently. I think the devil knows that if you took God at his word and with his last dying breath on that cross, he muttered out, it is finished. It would cause you to start living with a boldness, a courage, and a confidence that comes through knowing and believing that God's grace is sufficient. It's enough. He's forgotten my sin. He's forgiven my past so I can passionately pursue all that he has for me. Oh, I'm perceiving now. I'm perceiving now. I'm perceiving now. I can't stay stuck. I've been commissioned. I can't stay stuck. I've been called. I can't stay stagnant. I've been chosen. God does not expect your perfection. He wants your passionate pursuit. So get passionate and start receiving. Sing this out you believe it's true.